Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the news this week, science has been taken over by yet more science, netting the amount of science to exactly the same amount as last week, where we measured the two separate aspects of science separately and added them together anyway. Starting off the news this week, scientists have made a mouse see-through, publishing their work in the journal Science. A common problem when trying to study the human body, and indeed any body, is that our skin and more hides a lot of the inner workings, so we have to use special imaging equipment to see past the skin and take a peek at whatever it is we want. If the skin and other things like fat and muscles could be made temporarily see-through, this would massively help biological research. It could also make surgeries into the body easier, shorter and safer, as you wouldn't have to stick a camera inside to see what was going on. Well, the research done by these scientists could help that idea become a reality, as they have successfully used a commonly found yellow food dye and an intimate knowledge of how light works to direct light through the mouse being tested in such a way that the skin becomes temporarily see-through without harming the rodent. Of course, this science is still very early days and there's still a lot more work to be done if this is ever to be usable on humans. But if this research can be applied to humans, it could be pretty revolutionary on a number of different levels. In other news, researchers have tested a type of gene therapy on people with a rare genetic condition that usually causes blindness in early childhood, with rather exciting results. Publishing their results in The Lancet, the researchers found their sight improved by a hundredfold, with some patients even achieving the maximum score in the eye that was treated. The condition in question is called labor congenital amaurosis 1 and occurs in 2 to 3 per 100,000 newborn children. Despite its rarity, it is one of the most common causes of childhood blindness, as it is usually childhood when it shows its effects. Speaking to Penn Medicine News, the study's lead author said that one patient reported for the first time being able to navigate at midnight outdoors only with the light of a bonfire, which is a hugely significant improvement and very exciting news for people with this condition. One of the main purposes of this study was to test the safety of the gene therapy and the possible side effects with different dosages. Almost all observed side effects were attributed to the procedure rather than the treatment administered, with most healing afterwards. A couple of patients did report mild inflammation of the eye, but this was reversed with steroid treatment. As exciting as this news is, there still needs to be more trials before this treatment can be used in the wider world. It is still a very promising step for medicine and will, hopefully in the future, be able to help a great number of children see better. And now, a story from a paper published in the journal Nature with one of the coolest titles I've ever read. Dimensional crossover in a quantum gas of light. Basically, physicists created a photon gas by exciting a dye solution using a specialised laser. A polymer nanostructure was built as a container to encourage this process and to help force the photon gas into a single dimension, instead of the three dimensions, four if you count time, that stuff usually experiences. When you reduce the dimensions of a substance, its characteristics change as well. The scientists then forced the photon gas into a singular dimension, allowing the thermal fluctuations of the photon gas to be much larger than if it existed in two dimensions. As the title of the paper suggests, one of the main findings of this paper was the data gathered as the photon gas transitioned through the dimensions. This data can go on to help support further research of how materials react in similar states and further perfect the method to get substances into a singular dimension. First up in the paleontology news for this week, we welcome a new species of titanosaur from Spain. It was found in rocks dating to the end of the Cretaceous period, between 75 to 70 million years ago, and has been given the name Cuncosaura pintaquiniestra. It's known from a decent chunk of the skeleton that was found partially articulated. Many tail, back and some neck vertebrae were found, along with bits of the limbs and a nearly complete pelvic girdle. Cuncosaura is found to be a member of the titanosaur lineage Saltosauroidea, making it a relative of the well-known Saltosaurus from Argentina. 
This new discovery also reveals a lot about titanosaur evolution and distribution across continents, showing that the European titanosaur sauropod faunas of this time were a mix of small, medium and large species that were members of two lineages. One of these lineages likely arrived here after migrating from Africa when it was connected to Europe and continued to evolve in isolation, while the other, which this new species is a part of, probably came from Asia at a later time. So, Kunkasaura gives us an improved understanding of the wonderfully complex interchange of sauropod species all over the world and their amazing evolution. Also in the recent news is the very exciting discovery of a new species of Asdarkoid pterosaur, the group that includes the largest flying animals to ever exist. The new species has been named Inabtanin alarabia, and it was a fairly sizeable animal with a wingspan of around 5 meters that lived right at the end of the Cretaceous period around 66 million years ago. It's known from a partial skeleton discovered in Jordan, including upper and lower jaws, neck vertebrae, bones from the left shoulder and wing, and an almost complete right wing. In addition to describing this new species, the paper also reports the discovery of another fossil that they refer to Aramborgiania, an already known enormous Asdarkid with a potential wingspan of around 10 meters or 33 feet. This specimen is a partial fragment from the shaft of the right humerus, but considering how little we have of this giant pterosaur, it's still very exciting. The paleontologists also examined the flight capabilities of Inabtanin and Aramborgiania based on these new finds by micro CT scanning the bones to investigate their internal structures. They found that the huge Aramborgiania had helical ridges on the inner surfaces of the humerus, similar to birds that saw, whereas the smaller Inabtanin had hollow struts within the humerus reminiscent of the internal structure of flapping birds. This therefore seems to reflect the mechanical forces the pterosaur wings experienced in the air and can be used to infer the flying styles of these extinct reptiles. So some absolutely incredible discoveries. Also in the recent paleo news, we've got another new study on the prehistoric armoured fish Dunkleosteus, as once again they've gone shrunk the dunk. Or in the immortal words of Blian, I can't even beginkle to thinkle how they shrinkled the dinkle. The new paper describes in incredible detail the likely life appearance of Dunkleosteus, based on our knowledge from the fossils of these animals and the anatomy of related fishes. Although the front part of the body of the dunk is very well known, the back end of it isn't represented well by fossils, and so previous reconstructions of the animal had overestimated its size, as a study published by the same author last year showed. In this new research, they find that the type species Dunkleosteus terelli had a relatively stout and deep trunk, giving it an overall body shape actually quite like other very fast swimming vertebrates, such as white sharks, tuna and ichthyosaurs. The front part of the body would have been very stiff due to the interlocking armour plates and a fused spine, while it also had very large muscles on its sides that enabled powerful strokes of its tail to propel itself quickly through the water. So, this stocky, deep-bodied dunk would have been a very active and rapid swimmer, likely engaging in short bursts of speed to capture prey. The study also doesn't increase the body size estimates either, with a maximum length of just over 4 meters or 13.5 feet deemed most likely. A wonderful new study that highlights the unique swimming mechanics of these fish compared to modern ones and presents a fascinating new view of the dunk. And finally for the news this week, a paper has been published reporting on the discovery of polar dinosaur tracks in Victoria, Australia. This trackway was laid down in sediments that were deposited during the early Cretaceous period, between about 140 to 125 million years ago. These tracks were made by medium to large bodied theropods plus a few small herbivorous ornithopods, and are important as they show that dinosaurs were indeed actually living and walking about in this environment, instead of it just being a place that their bodies were washed to when they died. Two of the tracks are now the largest theropod footprints from the early Cretaceous of Australia, and were likely made by animals about the same size as the Megaraptor Australovenator. These footprints, as well as other quite large ones, confirm the presence of these big polar theropods here in this geological formation, which previously had only been known from a few scrappy remains of fossil bone. 
The paleontologists also suggest that these tracks were made when these dinosaurs were walking nearby to rivers after a spring thaw flooding during a polar summer, giving us an incredible glimpse into the lives of these prehistoric animals so long ago. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed and, as always, we'll see you on Sunday.